Hello and welcome to the Virtually Agile Meetup. I am not Chris Stone. My name is Fred Dykler, one of the facilitators here and organizers with the Virtually Agile Meetup uh, with Chris Stone. He's currently in uh, Baku, Azerbaijan at a conference. But we are here today joined by none other than Mark Grove. Mark is someone I met at, a, at the Global Scrum Gathering in Portland earlier this year um and and hit it off and so mark's here to talk to us about cumulative flow diagram so uh mark's an agile coach and managing consultant with excella in arlington virginia He's, he has over 24 years in it profession with the last 10 years focusing on coaching individuals and teams while leveraging practices from both kanban and scrum uh he coaches and mentors focusing on understanding the flow of work system optimization optimization value delivery and team dynamics uh, he's developed numerous interactive training sessions like this one has spoken at several agile conferences like that global scrum gathering i mentioned earlier uh mark is kanban university accredited kanban trainer kanban coach and a certified scrum professional so we are all awesome we are all excited to have mark here to talk to us about cumulative flow diagram so I'm going to turn it over to you, Mark. You can share your screen. I'll hit approve, and I will go on mute so we don't get any kind of echo. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Fred, and thank you, Virtually Agile, for inviting me today. Greatly appreciate it. Um, so this, as Fred indicated, we, we did meet in Portland where I had the luxury of a little bit more time to present this. It is half a lecture. Or lecture is a, not a, it's a kind of a turnoff word, but le me talking for a little bit about what a CFD is. And then the other half, if we have time or when we have the time, we're going to have to rush through it. It's kind of like a workshop where your participation is greatly appreciated. We're going to have to play it by ear a little bit today to just to see how well that's going to go. The first and foremost thing that I'm hoping that you get from today is just a better appreciation of what a cumulative flow diagram is and how you might be able to use it with your own teams. All right. So... Uh, this title is Thinking Critically, and that's really what I'm hoping you'll be able to get out of today is just uh, how do we think about what we're looking at or what we're observing, okay? So as Fred said, uh, I'm a real big uh, fanatic on the concepts of flow and uh, system optimization and how we can use those ideas to better how we manage our work, mostly our knowledge work. And um, I've been with uh, Kanban University as a trainer and a, and a coach for six years, five, six years uh, for now. Also, on the, I love Kanban so much that my license plate is actually talks about what the, one of the Kanban practices, which is limiting WIP. So if you're ever in Virginia, uh, in the States, limit WIP, that's my license plate there. And uh, by all means, um, you know, wave and say hello. All right, so for today's agenda, uh, and I am going to be going kind of quickly just because of the time that we have. So today's agenda, uh, we're going to look about why you might, might care, care about the CFD, how you, how you go about constructing it. We'll talk briefly about three flow metrics. And then part two is kind of the workshop. And we'll kind of just have to work through it in real time versus me giving you a moment to think. We'll just, we'll just kind of just kind of work at that through in, in, in a kind of a quick fa fashion today. Um, I do want to state that today's discussion around the CFD is tool agnostic, so I'm not talking about any particular tool to create a CFD. Um, I created everything that you're going to see today, I created in Excel because it was very easy to manipulate the data to show what I wanted to show. But I'm not talking about a CFD in JIRA versus another tool versus another tool. That's really not important. What is important is how we can interpret what we're seeing. Okay. Real quickly, why might you care about the CFD? Well, it is a great way to understand the flow of work. Um, we all work in flow, whether we know it or have made it explicit or not is another story, but we do work in a, a flow fashion, okay? And within that, it can help us identify recurring patterns or bottlenecks, uh, even help into predictability a little bit. So I like those things about the CFD. It also keeps front and center three important flow metrics. And a lot of people don't necessarily realize that a CFD has embedded within it three flow metrics. And we'll take a look at that. 
And then I'm also a strong believer that uh, a CFD is probably better than a, a your typical burn down chart, your velocity based burn up or burn down chart. And we'll take a look at some examples there if all goes well in terms of our timing. And because I can't see any of you now that I'm sharing just the way this is working out, if you need me to pause or if I'm not catching a cue, I, I can't even see the time. So I know roughly what time I have, uh, but please interrupt me uh, as we go through this. I'm showing you this screen here because this is the convention that we're going to use uh, for throughout this time together here. And I wanna go over it real briefly with you. Up above, uh, you can see just a basic Kanban board, whether you're a scrum team or a non-scrum team and you use flow all the way through um, with no sprints, for example. Uh, I'm just using this simple Kanban board of discover, implement, verify, and done. If you want to think of this as analysis, development, test, and done, that's fine. However, I want to be very clear that this is just an example of a Kanban board. By no means does a Kanban board have to be analysis, dev, test, done. I've worked with marketing teams and public relations companies, which, of course, don't have those types of column names to help describe their flow of work. I'm just doing that for because I just picked it. Okay, everything to the left of that double line, uh, I'm calling options. If you want to think of it as a backlog, that's fine too. But uh, this is this uh, this is the convention that we're going to be using today. These little yellow uh, stickies that you see here represent, let's just say for today, user stories or some type of item that delivers value once you get it to done. Okay, they're not tasks per se. Uh, but they're actually the things that we want to get to done because when they are done, they've completed some type of value delivery for our customer. Down below, you'll see a typical CFD, and there's a relationship, obviously, between the board that you see above and the CFD that you see down below. Real quickly, for those who don't know exactly the background or how to look at a CFD, the columns that you see up here directly correspond to the bands that you see down here in the CFD, okay? So discover, as you can see by the key here, corresponds to this discover band, implement will be this nice lime green, verify light blue, and total done, this uh, part down here, done. Your X axis is marked by time, and your Y axis here is marked by the quantity, um, the quantity of items, those yellow stickies, if you will, that are flowing through this particular Kanban system, but that's that's what the y-axis is, is measuring there. So, um, so that's the convention that we're going to be using, and I'm going to start off by really taking a step, at small steps in understanding how the CFD is constructed, kind of like behind the scenes, if you will. So as you can see here, I've got three different ways of looking at the same data. We're going to take a look at this, just a pretend Kanban board here right now. And as you can see, I have two work items in Discover, two in Implement, two in Verify, and one in Done. And keep in mind, everything after this double line is an indication that we have begun working on this piece of work with the intention of finishing it, with the intention of moving it to Done, everything there. So. Down below, I have a table that just simply mimics what you see in this, uh, this Kanban board, two in Discover, two in Implement, two in Verify. And then also, you can see in the CFD here, I have, using our key here, two in Discover, and you can see the Discover is this blue here. So if we went straight across like this and this, two items there, and then two items in Implement, and then two items in Verify. And if we go to the next day, the 2nd of October, think some things have shifted a little bit, right? This was our day before. This is our new day. And as you can see, we now have three items in Discover, three in Implement, two in Verify, and two in Done. And as we move our work through our Kanban system, or if we're a Scrum team through the system in which you're, you know, you've, you've figured out your Scrum team works in, um, these items are going to change, obviously, through this through this flow. And so down below, we have three items in Discover, three in Implement, two in Verify, two in Done, just like you see here. And you can see that being reflected in this bar chart up above, okay? And I'll just go through this a couple more times, but three in Discover, three right here, this yellow, this green band, three in Implement, two in Verify, two in Done. 
And I'll go one more day showing that now we have four items done total. So you can see that this bottom row here is four items done total. And where people sometimes get a little mixed up is saying, well, I completed two items from the 2nd to 3rd of October. I completed two items, but the CFD is capturing the total completion. That's where the cumulative portion comes from, okay? It's an accumulation. So you're not graphing just the fact that you completed two items, but you're actually graphing the total completed. And you can see that in that stacked bar chart there again, just like before. Now, this looks great and it's nice to see, but we're talking, we won't, really the CFD looks different than this, right? This is kind of what's happening. Each snapshot you can think of as a vertical bar chart. But really what's happening when, with the CFD and the way, they're, way, way we, we look at them is you can think of it is that those sections of the, vert the, the vertical bar chart are really connected with each other. Each of these sections is connected maybe by a line that has the same color. And then we can take it a step further and say, well, let's color in those sections. And now we begin to see, oh, this is how a CFD is actually being constructed. We have snapshots being taken, in my case, every day here, snapshots being taken every day, but we're coloring in those the, the space, if you will, in between those days. And so as our days uh, continue, and as we are moving items across the board, we can see that we are building out that flow, and it does look very flowy here, wouldn't you say? We are building out that flow within a cumulative flow diagram, okay? Every day is a snapshot. Notice the cumulative total done is increasing, and you can see that here, it's just, it's total, total increasing as well, okay? So that bottom band, if you will, is the total done, and as we move things, as each day we take a snapshot, um, I usually like to take a snapshot after the stand-up because people probably move some things. It's like, let's take our snapshot after our, our daily stand-up or our daily scrum. And um, then I'll, I'll build out the CFD to show something like this. So, okay. So, Mark. Yeah. The, um, the totally done is cumulative. It's like it adds up over time, but those other statuses those are like the measurement of that snapshot in time right yep that's exactly right okay now let's take this another step so that's that's the construction of it and in my examples i am taking a snapshot every single day in my examples and i think that's realistic it doesn't have to be every day you can do it every week you can do it every minute you know, you know who knows but um I take mine every day. Uh, it's good to know, to ask the team, if you're working with a new team, when are you taking your snapshot? Because the X axis may be labeled every week, like just because that's the way it, they label it. But really it's good to know when as things are, are snapshotted or snapshot um, for when it's taken. And I'll show you some examples of that if, if you're not sure what I'm saying. Okay, so let's take a look at three important flow metrics embedded within a CFD. And those three are the work in progress, WIP, it's like my license plate, uh, cycle time, time to complete. So once you bring an item into that system past that double line, it's not a trivial event either. It's like you're, you're actively moving this in because you anticipate to finish it, you anticipate the customer to take delivery of it. So it's, it's a serious thing when you move it in. And then last thing is throughput, which is the number of items completed per unit of time. And I wanna be clear, that when I talk about cycle time for today's discussion, today's discussion, I am talking about the time from the moment you move a sticky into here to when it moves to here. Other people might call this lead time. Other people might call this system lead time. Other people might call this um, customer lead time. You shouldn't, but they might. I'm simply calling it cycle time for today's discussion. You can go online, you can look up any of these definitions that I've just rattled off and you're gonna find, or any of these words, you're gonna find 30 definitions, they're all different. What's important is you know how you're defining them. So I'm defining cycle time again as the moment you move something to discover until it gets to done. That's just the words that I chose to use today, cycle time. So these three important flow metrics are embedded within your CFD. 
And also some of you I'm sure know that these three flow metrics actually have a relationship with each other. And that relationship is called Little's Law. And Little's Law is beyond the discussion we're having today, but Little's Law looks like this, where the average cycle time is equal to the average whip divided by the average throughput. And this formula is governed by five very, very important assumptions, which we're not gonna talk about today either. But what's important to know is you just, you cannot simply plug in a whip and a throughput and, be, and to expect to know what your cycle time is going to be. That is not how this law works. Um, it's more of a retroactive law. So after you've built out something in your CFD, you can use this to understand the relationship of these metrics. But I put this slide in here to simply let you know that I know that these three metrics are related to each other by means of this thing called Little's Law. All right. So what does it look like in terms of a CFD? So here we have a CFD uh, down below. You can see that the x-axis is marked off by weeks, October 1st, October 8th, October 15th. However, just so you know, um, the snapshot is being taken every single day. So I even wrote that data is recorded every day. So snapshot is every single day. It's just the x-axis is shown on a per week basis. I am going to pick a day. I'm going to pick October 29th. And we're first going to look at our first metric. And we're going to look at the metric called WIP, work in progress. And the way you measure WIP on a CFD is you take a look at the vertical distance of a particular band or bands. And in this case, I am taking a look at that vertical distance for my entire Kanban system. So that is obviously from discover all the way down to done. So everything that's in here, we can consider to be WIP. And that kind of makes sense, right? It's those bands, as was already asked, shows the number of items. So yeah, that makes sense. That's the number of items that are in progress. They haven't finished yet. Okay, so on October 29th, we can retroactively look back and say, well, it looks like there were 11 items. And if we draw this horizontal red, band, red bar across, we can, or nine items, excuse me, um, we can show that uh, there are nine items that are in, um, in our system. 20 items starting with discover, and then 11 items if we march it all the way down to done. So 20 minus 11, hence we have nine items, okay? So there's our whip. I'm gonna gray that out a little bit. You can still see it there. And we're now gonna talk about our average cycle time. Well, the average cycle time, again, and this kind of makes sense if you think about what you're looking at here is like I've told you, the cycle time as I'm defining it is from the moment something enters your system all the way to when it's done. Well, then no surprise when you look at a CFD, that's kind of what we're showing. That is what we're showing here in this dotted black line when we brought it into the system to when it gets done. Okay. And if we draw vertical lines, you can see that, like I told you, we brought it in on the 29th of October. It looks like it finishes near the 19th of November. Well, that's about 21 days or about three weeks. Okay. So what we can say is for the item that was brought in back in the 29th, it took on average approximately three weeks to finish. Okay, so there's our second metric embedded within our CFD. Okay, I'm gonna gray that one out a little bit. And we're gonna take a look at our last one. Our last one is the average throughput. It kind of completes the triangle here. Okay, so the throughput is a rate. It's rise over run. It's the slope of the line here. It's the slope of that done line, if you will. And we already know what our two runs, what our run and what our rate is, right? Our rise over run is what I meant to say. So it's a rise over run. So it's a slope. But we already know what those numbers are. We know that because we took our nine items from our whip. Oops. We took our nine items from our whip and we took our 21 days or our three weeks from our cycle time. And as you can see on the left side of the screen here, nine items over 21 days, our throughput for this particular time frame is nine over 21, which is about three items per week. So when we look at this CFD, we can say, well, for this particular team, it looks like they're finishing 
definitely within the time frame. But even if you look at the CFD, just just smartly but casually observing, it looks like they're finishing things at a rate of about three items uh, per week, three items per week. The slope of this line doesn't get too crazy. It doesn't go up a lot, it doesn't go down. It looks pretty much at that rate, okay? So those are the three metrics that are embedded within the CFD. And real quickly, I'm gonna go through this really fast. WIP can play a really big role in affecting time to completion. So this is a triangle that we've been looking at for the last several slides. I'm gonna change the CFD a little bit to show, there's their old triangle, there's the, I've made it red, but that's the, that's the old triangle that we were just looking at. But notice that I've added more stuff to discover. Discover, the band in discover has gotten larger. Okay. And what is the consequence of that? When you have more WIP in your system, what happens to your cycle time? It increases. And you probably hear Agilist talking about this all the time. The more items you have in your system, the longer it takes for any single item to complete. And well, this is kind of that graphical representation of what's happening there. The more items you have, you have no choice but on average to wait longer for any single item to get to done. The cycle time has increased. And you can see that difference from the red to the black. And that's just because I increased the band or the whip in one of those bands there happens to be discover. And the way I think about this is when I've worked with teams, oftentimes, and why I think this is so important, oftentimes there is always this desire to finish faster, whether you hear from management or internal or just people like, oh, we got to finish faster, you got to finish faster. And lots of times when we have that desire, we also have this belief that, well, let's start more items because if we start more items, then one of them is destined to finish faster. That might be the thoughts of maybe tr more traditional project management thinking or, or people who aren't as familiar with flow systems. The problem with that is that that means that we need to have more items in progress. So the more we believe we need to start more items, the more items we have in progress, and the more items we, but the more items we have in progress, we just saw that the longer our cycle times are, that's what the plus means, there's a direct relationship. Uh, so the longer our cycle times are. But for people who don't really know what's going on, they start measuring and they start seeing, well, it's taking longer and longer to get things done, well, what do they think? Well, we need to start more items. And we get ourselves in this loop sometimes. And this is what's called, this can be a, a reinforcing loop. All of a sudden you see boards that have all this stuff in it. And it's because they're stuck in this loop of thinking, things are taking longer. Well, let's bring something else in because maybe that'll get done fast. It's just a small item. But in reality, we're reinforcing ourselves and, and just making everything on average take longer and longer. Sorry. So we should, I call this tongue in cheek, start starting and stop finishing, which is of course not what we want to be doing. We want to be doing the opposite of that, which as many of us know is stop starting and start finishing and not start starting. Okay. And stop finishing. Okay. So that was a very, very fast run through of part one of today. Um, so this part two, I'm hoping that you guys can participate a little bit in, in this part two. This is what we're gonna be doing. You've seen how a CFD is constructed. We've done it briefly, but you've seen how it's constructed. You, you understand how the three metrics are, how they interplay with each other in there. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at some patterns, some CFD patterns that might be familiar to you. You may have seen or used with your teams or have come up with your teams. And we're gonna do three things. We're gonna practice on our observational skills. We're gonna look at each of these CFDs and we're gonna simply ask ourselves, what are we noticing here? What are we seeing? What patterns might be representing here? Have we noticed this before? Um, if you were working with teams, you would probably wanna ask your teams, well, what do you see when you're looking at this pattern? So that's number one. The second thing we're gonna do is we're gonna ask ourselves, based on what we're seeing, why do we think this might be occurring? What could be causing this pattern? Have I ever seen this before? And if I have, what has past experience taught me about this pattern? Okay. Um, and then of course, what questions might you be asking the team? What, you know, why do you think this is occurring team? If you're an agile coach, if you're someone who 
wants to help teams and facilitate teams through their through their discovery of what's going on as a as a system or as a as a team, uh, that would be something that you'd probably want to be understanding. Why do you think this is happening? And then the third thing we're going to be asking ourselves is based on those first two things, what might we suggest to get us out of this pattern? If we don't like what we're seeing, what are some things that we might be doing, might try maybe an experiment to do differently? Okay, what ideas do you have to address the pattern? Are there any experience, experiments out there? Uh, maybe asking the team, have you already tried one of, one of these experiments or have you tried anything at all? Okay, so what ideas might you have? So these are the three questions. We're gonna ask these three questions each time we see a pattern. These three questions are gonna be on the left side of the screen as we take a look at the CFD. Okay, so this is what we're gonna do. If we were in Portland, I would set aside three or four minutes for you to talk amongst yourselves at a team and I would go off mic. We're not gonna do that today. Instead, I'm gonna facilitate this in real time, but I do hope that I can hear from some of you as we take a look at our first pattern. So this is our first pattern. Take a moment to just ask yourself, what am I seeing here? Real simple, what are you noticing? Why do we think it might be occurring? This is where they pay you the big bucks to be an agile coach or an agilist, right? All right, well, that's great you see that, but why is it happening? What might you suggest? All right, so all of you out there, great agilists, what, um, what is it that you're seeing here? That um, the discover seems to increase while the done is, uh, sorry, the discover is increasing while the, um, while the done is decreasing. So there's a, you can see we're not finishing what we're supposed to finish. Yeah, absolutely. And the other thing I'm seeing here is like, yeah, it's like the done is all is plateauing. So we're at, we're we're still starting stuff until we're right diverting people to uh, say we need to start more. Maybe like that story you were telling uh, before, which is like we're not finishing things fast enough. So let's start more things. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we, because we can move along, uh, that's a great observation. So obviously. We have, uh, you know, let me go back like this. We have things in Discover getting bigger and bigger. Why might that be happening? So in chat, they say uh, we're bringing in new and additional work and not getting stuff done. Uh, throughput is decreasing. Mm -hmm. So some things, maybe there's no whip limits, you know, on the discover column. Maybe you don't know. This could be your first day on the job and you're starting to ask around, but maybe there's no whip limits. Maybe uh, management is pushing work onto them. So they're not respecting any type of pool system that could, that should be happening here. Um, uh, maybe they don't really understand how a Kanban system works or how to really regulate the amount of work that should be coming in. So all, all really good points, really good observations there. And, you know, some lots of times why it might be occurring is also kind of leads you to what might you suggest. So you may suggest, well, let's put whip limits on here. Maybe as an Agilist, Agile coach, if you're brought in, you might have to go talk to upper management. Maybe you got to work with the team a little bit more to help them understand that, the number of items coming into your system should, for the most part, reflect how many items are exiting your system. We can see the slope of this line is much steeper than this one. So we have no choice to know, to know that there's more items continuing. And not only that, but your cycle time, as we've seen, is going to get larger and larger. Great job. Let's take a look at another one. Seems like people are skipping some phases. Yeah. In some situations, they think either implement or verify is not needed, or so I guess we're getting. Yeah, people are saying testing's happening late. All right, Mark, I'll unmute you now. Yeah. So really good observations, right? We're so we're seeing that, for example, if, if we if think of verify as test, uh, all of a sudden we're not doing it here. So that would be a great question to start with. Why not? 
I noticed this. Why is it not happening? Um, maybe I, I don't. I, we don't necessarily know what the answer is going to be, but uh, maybe they're maybe the type of work they're doing right here doesn't need testing. Uh, you know, who knows? Doesn't need it. Um, there could be other reasons uh, why it's not happening. It's kind of hard to do this without being able to talk back and forth. But um, up here, we notice implement. There's no items in implement. We could have a very cross-functional team where they're able to kind of do a little of both and they kind of go more to where the work is needed. So that would be something worth exploring. Um, uh, we do notice there has been a big increase in what was done here. Part of the reason is because nothing was needed to be verified. So a big jump in the stuff that was done. Um, so I would certainly be asking, what, why, why are you not verifying anything here? Um, you know, until we talk to the right people, we don't necessarily know. All right, just because we're we're limited on time, I'm going to jump to number three. And would love to hear from you if you have any ideas on what you what you see and why you think it might be happening. I think I know this one. I think I've seen this one, but I want to see if anyone in the audience knows this one. Uh, let's see. System has more demand capacity than demand. Maybe, but it's probably something uh, many of you on this call are very familiar with. Waterfall is what Idris says. I don't, probably not. Looks like three week sprint, no? Scrum, three week sprints, absolutely. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you, Mark. Mark. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's when I created this. Um, you know, I've done. I've recorded data like this for for scrum teams and you you do have a stair step approach which is not a surprise because you would expect things to be done and i realize done can have many meanings but at least for a team done at the end of a you know an iteration in this particular case it have to be three week sprint so that's kind of what's happening here the team is opening up work they work on it for a while and then they close it and i made it very dramatic like to look the same i did that on purpose just to kind of to really train our brains to be looking for these types of patterns, basically. Opening and closing, it's happening very regularly here. So the first question, just like you said, are you a scrum team? That would help me understand a little bit about what you are and, and what, I don't necessarily know, is it anything bad happening here? That's very consistent. I don't know if we'll ever see anything this consistent in the real world, but um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. All right, let's take a look at another one. Notice the X axis is different here. This is a scrum team that sprint starts on a Wednesday and ends two weeks later on a Tuesday. Okay, what, what do you see here? There's a couple interesting things going on here. They seem like they're testing before they actually start completing it so they try to see if it works or not and then they go into done it looks like hg in the chat said uh finishing up rollover work from the previous sprint so you know maybe they're not committing to their to their work in their sprint a bunch of rollover from the next sprint absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. um Excellent observations. Uh, the first thing I would be looking at is what exactly is happening here. Now, it could be the case that the snapshot that you took was not aligned with, with, re with you know, how can I say this? The first thing I would ask is, is this leftover work? Somebody already mentioned it. Are, th are these things that were brought in from the prior sprint? Okay. So, and the other reason why I would ask that question is, what are we noticing over here? Thing, everything wasn't done. We can see that. We know we've got, if it's a sprint, we know we've got all this stuff. We've got this amount of stuff that hasn't been done. Is this a regular pattern? This is just one sprint. But if this is their fifth sprint <coughs> or whatever, you might want to look back at sprint four. Do you have one for sprint four? And are you seeing a pattern of not finishing things? And because we didn't finishing things, we're now bringing it in. And that could be what's in, being shown here. In fact, they don't even work on anything 
brand new until the third day into their sprint. Not that that's bad, it's just what you're observing. So good, good, uh, good observations, folks. All right, here's another one. I'll tell you what, uh, I'll just talk this one through. What I wanted to show here was kind of the opposite of one we saw earlier. Here we're showing a rate of completion faster than the rate of arrival, this discover. This discover slope is, is flatter than our completion rate or our throughput rate. So what could be happening here is we're running out of work. We're not populating our flow as fast as we should be. Uh, it could be lots of reasons. Maybe the team is getting smaller. This could be a fixed uh, a fixed date project where we're, we're supposed to be running out of work. Um, um, you know, people come up with all kinds of crazy ideas. So, um, and and valid crazy ideas. I don't mean crazy as in not good, but just a lot of good ideas out there. So, something else to be thinking about. You know, if we see the rate of arrival less than the, the rate of completion, you might be one asking some questions around, is this project coming to a close? Um, if not, then maybe we have an upstream process that isn't feeding our downstream process as well as it should be. And that would be something to look at as well. All right, with this one, I wanted to show that we should never see a downward blip in a CFD as we are seeing here, okay? A CFD should either be flat or going up, but never down, okay? So sometimes when I'm working with teams, what I'll hear and what I'll see is teams saying, well, we had it in our test area, our test column or verify. We found a problem with it, so we moved it back to implement. And that's a no-no, you, you don't do that. You bring the people to where the work is, you don't bring the work to where the people is. So if you see something like this, it's definitely worth investigating. Um, this will also really mess up with your predictability. If you want to think about your predictability in terms of that cycle time, um, uh, that the cycle time that we looked at, the average cycle time that moves across, this, you're double counting work here. You've counted it once when it went through, and then if you move it back, you're gonna count the same thing twice. And it's there's lots of problems with it. So. So don't, don't move your items back. That's what we're showing here. All right, I wanna talk briefly about the CFDs and burn down charts. All right, so we're gonna assume a scrum team. So the um, I'm gonna pretend here, like we've been doing, that this is a scrum team. Again, you can see by the x-axis, their sprint starts on a Wednesday. Two weeks later, it ends on a Tuesday. And this is an example of a scrum team. It's all made up, all fictitious here, but a team that finished all of its items at the end of the sprint, okay? And we know this because we can see that our done line went up to the very top and uh, they have completed everything. Now, what would a burn down look like for this? Whether you're burning down story points or you're burning down the actual items themselves, a burn down would look like this. So I ask you, what is more informative, this or this? Well, I think we would all agree that this gives you a lot more information, right? This line right here, this done line right here, if we just turned it upside down and I think twisted it 45 degrees, that's what this is. That's all that this is. This is that burn up, if you will, but it's only recording what you've done what you finished. If you move to a CFD and kept track of where your items were within the flow of your team, look at all the extra information you're gathering. And think about all the extra things you've just learned and we've practiced with the other CFDs. So the burn down in my book, I'm not a big fan, the burn down is very limited and really gives you the same information that you'd get here anyway. I mean, it's right here. It's right here. Now I worked with a client that their tool, their, uh, it was JIRA, their tool, this is the way this company was set up, forced teams to use a very simple to do doing done board. Their board was nothing more than for a sprint team. This is the work I'm going to do. This is the work I'm doing. And this is when it's done. That's all we were allowed to do. And so, 
they would use burn down charts and a burn down chart might look something like this. I mean, we just made this up, but all right. So they didn't get a lot of stuff done until the Thursday of the second week. And then they started getting things done and then they finished everything by the end of the sprint. Even in a very simple, basic to do doing done board, your CFD can still glean just a little bit more information than if you used a burn down chart only, even with a very basic board like this. Again, this part right here is what this is. It's just turned upside down and around a little bit. But here, at least we can say, oh, you didn't start two items right away. In fact, you didn't start two items until the, what, the, the one week later. Um, actually, right here. You didn't start until one week and a day later. Uh, or you opened up eight items right at the beginning of the sprint. You can't get that from here. You just know when you've completed stuff. Here, you're able to gather a little bit more information. Here's another basic to do doing done board. I just made up a different burn down. Okay, I just made up, this might look a little bit better, right? We're finishing things a little bit more throughout the two week sprint. Again, this is what the done looks like. So this is your burn down, same thing, just turned around and upside down, but the same thing. But look at the extra information a CFD gives you, even with a basic to do doing done. We know that we didn't start everything right away. In fact, we opened up four items, then we opened up one more, and then things were kind of static for a while. This extra information, I think it's worth, even for a basic board like this, to gather it, to create it, to keep track of this, and not just rely on a burn down. You're getting it anyway. You're getting it right here. It's a burn up, if you will, but you're getting this extra information as well. All right, so that pretty much that does that that, that that concludes everything. It's the fastest I've ever done this. So thank you for sticking there and with me logging off. So thank you for that. Um, I am happy to answer any questions, Fred, as long as you don't mind turning on and off the mic. I'm happy to do that. But thank you all for for sticking in there and for and for um, coming today. Thanks so much. All right, absolutely. And uh, me, if you want to unshare your screen in a second, because then you can see us all. Uh, on the left side of the screen, you'll know some reaction. I'm going to turn the soundboard on for everybody. So feel free to give some applause and thanks for Mark for everything he taught us today. And then we'll open up for some for some questions uh, from the audience. <laughs> I don't have a question. I just really want to say thank you very much. I've just joined a team who's working with Canva and it's my first time. So um, I've learned a lot and I hope to have a few more of these sessions that you do that uh, I can join. So thank you very much. Very much. Great. Thank you very much, Nikki. I appreciate that. So uh, if you ever want to talk Kanban, let me know. I'm on LinkedIn. I've literally just sent you, just sent you a <laughs> All right. I'll be looking for it. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Trying to be fast on the trigger. Um, I, you know, one thing I did like the last couple of slides, Mark, were like, you know, how do you uh, take your existing uh, tooling that you kind of saw, like maybe in Jira that you're using, where you see that burn down chart, which really, it just shows like when things are getting done. And it doesn't give you that whole story to bring to the team. And I guess, you know, one of the big things we want to, probably do is take this information to the team. It's not up to us to decide how the how the team works, right? A hundred percent. I I I'm trying to say something that you didn't already say. Just repeat what you're saying. Yeah. A hundred percent. Show them. Let them the, the beauty of of understanding your flow is and then having a nice graph to just to, to to show it as well is it gives such deeper insight as to how they're actually working. If you're noticing things getting wider Maybe that's a bottleneck. Well, why is it there? I mean, you can't get that with a burn down only. You just you just can't. All right. So uh, I want to you know I'm gonna want to thank y'all for for coming uh, today. Um, we will walk through our uh, we couldn't be here without some of our sponsors. So we'll walk through those uh, really quickly. Butter. Uh, it is a great platform. You get to share uh, information. I love the integrations. Uh, they have great integrations with. Miro, where you can actually work in a Miro board inside of uh, the Butter window. So you don't have to switch apps, which is very awesome. And uh, 
you do get a uh, free seven day trial and 30% off your first uh, three months. Agile testing days, Potsdam is coming up in Germany for Invisible Europe. It's coming up uh, very shortly. Chris will be speaking there uh, on site in Potsdam, and I will be speaking remotely. Uh, so you can catch us, uh, either of us, at the on site or uh, virtually. Uh, great conference. Looking forward to it. Uh, and lastly, we have Chris is a um, he works with the Scrum Mastery Pathway, which is a which is another um, certification that people can take. And the thing I, I like about this is you have a long term relationship with Chris and the and the Agile Mastery Institute, where you work together. It's more than just a two day class. Um, these are you know multiple month engagements where you come back, you check in, and you talk about your growth. And you know as a Scrum Master and Agile coach, uh, he's also giving away ten percent off his next six months with code SMP ten. Reach out to Chris for more details. And that is it. That is our sponsor. So once again, I want to thank you all for coming along for our journey today. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your knowledge uh, with everyone. I. Like I said, I enjoyed meeting you um, in Oregon earlier this year. I live in Oregon and the southern part, not Portland. Uh, so it was a short trip for me. I know you're on the East Coast. Um, it was wonderful to see you, and uh, thank you for, for sharing. Great. Thank you very much, Brad. Thanks, everyone.